Montana Police Department, but we're not perfect. And if we make mistakes, we'll hold people accountable. So please let us know if that's the situation. I <laughs> Who could have a bad attitude with you, Dave? <laughs> Sir. I have a question for you. Uh, youth driving cars and there's four youths in the car, you can't be attentive. When, where do you want their hands to be when you guys approach the car? Because you know kids have a tendency to move when they're 17, 16, you know sure. what I mean? And uh, I'm just curious, what should the, people, the passengers do? Because the driver has his hands sure. on the steering wheel. What should the passengers do? What How many of you in the scenarios got killed by someone shooting you with a gun they had in their feet? How many had uh, guns in someone's mouth that they shot? No, the hands are what, what we're concerned about. Right. So exactly. many times, we're, we're, we want folks to keep their hands when we come up on a traffic stop, especially during the initial contact, it's just someone that's in view. It's in view, if the kid's in the back seat, I, we don't want them to put their hands up when we do a traffic stop, but if they can put the hands on the headrest in front of them, they can keep their hands in their laps. It makes us very, very nervous when a carload of juveniles, when we make a traffic stop, and they're worried about the dime bag of weed that they have in their pocket, and they're moving all around in the back seat and trying to stuff in places, and we have to decide when we're walking up, is he hiding that dime bag of weed? Is he reaching for a knife? Is he reaching for a gun? Is he trying to get do something? And it, it raises our suspicion. Uh, so. The best advice I could give you, and the same thing I would tell my family members, is just keep your hands where you can sit. And very quickly, when I come up and I see, and your, your hands are on the steering wheel, I say, good afternoon, ma'am. The reason I stopped you is because you rolled through that stop sign back there. You make a complete stop. Do you have a driver's license? Yes, I do. Okay, can I see it, please? And we start to have this conversation and build this rapport and this relationship, and the, and the situation de-escalates very quick. And we can tell a whole lot of things during the very beginning in the the way that we have we have eye contact, the way we're having a nice conversation, we're treating each other like human beings. Uh, and that goes a long, long ways. So it's that body language too as well. So it's almost like you almost have to be like a psychologist. The whole time, you know, in the in stopping because you're like, you know, got all these different thoughts going on your head as you're approaching that person too, huh? Because of the demeanor. I wish we only had to be psychologists. We have to be psychologists, social workers, homeless advocates, mental health experts, uh, you know, crime scene investigation experts, all the things that we're asking our officers to do, more and more things we're putting on the plate. Many times of 23, 24 year old guys and gals with the, with the high school education. And we're dealing with people in these crisis and homeless issues and mental health issues because the system has failed them. They haven't gotten the help that they needed. Like me who has anxiety. What's the best approach for being stopped by an officer and being able to handle that without being suspicious? Sure. Uh, the best way to handle that is uh, just to follow the directions of the officers when they ask you for your license, registration, and insurance to provide that, to be cooperative during the traffic stop. And I would also encourage someone that has anxiety to say, if I were to say to you, what, what are you nervous about? You seem to be nervous. Officer, I suffer from anxiety and I, and I just, I'm naturally, because of my condition, I'm nervous and I don't mean to, to be disrespectful to you or, you know, just have a conversation like you would if I met you for the first time. And you would say something like, if you notice I'm, you know, I, I seem to be a little anxious, it's, I suffer from anxiety. And that really goes a long way, uh, just having open communication. And, and again, I'm really, really big on communication, and where we treat each other like people and we treat each other with respect. And, you don't know what, you could have You could have ran through a stop sign, I have no idea, and I stop you, and you just had the worst day of your life, and you're not gonna be in the best mood, and now on top of the worst day of your life, now you're gonna think that you're gonna get a ticket. And so many times, just having communication and respectful with each other, it, you know what, officer? I just had the worst day of my life. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize I didn't stop at that stop sign. That how many times that doesn't even result in a ticket? You know, where we just treat each treat each other with respect. Now I walk up to the car and you say, "What the hell are you stopping me for?" Those situations. That's where that's where we get into this back and forth that we fail to communicate. I can't possibly understand where you're coming from because you're being so aggressive with me that I have this constant sense of I have to be on my toes because I have no idea why it is you're acting. As long as we're humans, we're going to make errors. That it is extremely difficult to tell some, someone that is either on drugs or suffering some, from some sort of mental issue 
when they display identical symptoms. And a situation is volatile. So there's so many different things that we expect of our officers, but despite all of the things that we ask the men and women of the Fontana Police Department to do, we do it right the vast, vast majority of the time. Thank you. Is that when you do go through this simulator, please share your experience with us. Tell your friends, tell your family, Tell anybody that you know that the next time that you see a police video where it's that four or five second clip and you're like, ooh, that officer was wrong, you may want to sit back and go, oh, hold on, there was a lot more before that, there was a lot more after that. And you guys are going to see that as you come through this simulation, okay? We always say this is 20, 25 feet, right? <coughs> Roughly, okay? So if I'm a police officer and I get called to a man, I have no idea. All of this is just a subject and you have no idea. In his mindset, it goes back to mindset, right? His mindset is, I'm going to attack this police officer. When I get the moment, I'm going to do it because I need to get away. I need to go back to jail, whatever the case is. And I don't, in, in law enforcement, we don't have our guns out. We don't walk with our guns out all the time. It's not the way that it goes. How many believe that he can, once he starts to make his attack on me, can get to me before I can get out and draw and fire around on top of How many think that I can do that safely? Or that he would be able to get to me before that? We have a thing called the 21 foot rule, and what it is is it basically breaks it down that when he makes the decision that he's going to come at me and attack me, and even if he's just armed with a knife, he is gonna be about right here or so within striking distance before I can even get my weapon out and get a round on. So that's why when you see police officers, they're always trying to separate distance, distance, distance. It's because it gives us time to react. And you're going to see that a lot of the situations, especially in there, you're right here talking to someone. And it goes back to mindset. I don't know what he's thinking. So um, that's one of the things I kind of like to think about. That I just like to bring up that a lot of people are like, oh, that's a huge distance. There's no way the officer, the officer can make a decision before then or take him in custody or use his taser or whatever. Person who has a mindset and will to do it, we have to be really ready to make the decisions that we have to do. Um, that's pretty much it. We're going to run everybody through with two at a time, so it's going to be your partner, you and a partner, whoever it is. And when we get done, there's going to be situations where let's say she shoots and he doesn't. And I'm going to ask you, well, why did you shoot? But you guys are called to a park and it's a high gang area. Okay, so they're drinking in the park that is illegal in the city of Fontana and it's a known gang area. They got forties. <laughs> I know. Well, well she has a beard. They all beards. They just forty on. All right, everybody. Step where you are. Three. Step in. Right from the body. Kill everybody. And then when we go through it. Gun two. Gun two. So, yeah. Gun two. So he gets hit, right? Yeah. He finally goes down. Then the second guy comes up. Did you have justification to shoot him? When he came at me with the bottle, he was gonna throw it. That. In my mind, you have justification to shoot. Because, yeah, that's, that's a deadly weapon, why is right? It? Why is it a deadly weapon? What do you think? Because it's a glass bottle. <laughs> yeah, you think that would do some damage if <laughs> that hits yeah. yeah. That probably do some pretty good damage, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Here's, here's the headline. You just shot an unarmed man. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All he had was a bottle. All he had was a bottle, right? <laughs> You could have shot him in the leg. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could have put that, the taser out. And that's, <laughs> and that's kind of like what I want to point yeah. out to you guys. Is that's Now your the big title is police shoot unarmed man. Mm -hmm. Was he a threat? Yeah. yeah he's done severe damage to you. Had he mm -hmm. struck you with that bottle? Mm -hmm. yeah. right. The park is known for a high volume of a narcotic activity. And there have been numerous armed robberies in the park in the recent days. I can sit down with my hands up.
Wait, sir. What? Wait, uh, can you drop the bottle? Please? Do what? Drop the bottle. I ain't doing anything. This is where I live. Sir. I live back in there. Sir, can you just leave me alone. I'm not bothering anybody. Look, we just want to talk. Come on. Please just, drop the bottle. No, leave me alone. I didn't do nothing. Sir. What do you want? Sir. I didn't do nothing. Just leave me alone. Let's just talk about it then. I don't bother anybody. Let's just talk about it. This is my home. You gotta have a home somewhere. Yeah, I This is my home. Sir. Okay, you want the beer? Fine. You want me to put it down? Fine. I'll put it down. Hell with you. No, but stay right there. Sir, stay right there. Sir! Sir! Can you put your hand in shit? Sir! Empty clip! <laughs> Empty clip! <laughs> Empty the whole clip! Y'all yeah. play no games! after he went down. Okay, and in law enforcement, we have to justify every single shot. This, this man right here obviously had tactical experience. He was dodging and he tricked this. He played it off, so. And, and that's something. He pulled off a real weapon. So. How many total shots were there? Uh, Marty, how many were there total? Uh, the guy, they were uh, about 10 on gun one, and I want to say like 8 on gun two. So that's the headline. Yeah, so now you're going to yeah, put nice. that there was 14 shots on a man and six of them were after he was, because you got to remember, what do you have on your chest? Yeah, a big old body camera that shows exactly what happened. Homeless man shot 18 times. Homeless six of them were after the fact that he was. Now could you justify it?
he's continuing to advance on you by getting out of his car and coming towards you. You're, you gave him the commands, he didn't cooperate with you, so your mindset is, I gotta make a decision, what am I gonna do, shoot, don't shoot. Well, every situation is different, and you got a little bit of taste of that with every scenario is different. Uh, every traffic stop is different. Uh, every police, every time we contact someone is different. We go through a lot of training. Uh, to be a police officer, there's a six-month police academy, and once they graduate and join us here, we give them six months more of field training, where they work with a field training officer that's teaching them. Uh, and you do get additional information and, and training the more you contact people and the more you become pretty adept in reading people and being able to recognize danger signs. Uh, the, the traffic stop where I walk up to the car and the windows aren't tinted and I can clearly see in it and I see that it's someone that is doesn't seem to be acting suspicious uh, and you, then there's a there's always that level of officer safety where we're aware of what's going on and then we see we have a nice conversation and we start to de-escalate the situation. Uh, but there's something uh, called hypervigilance and that's where we think everybody's trying to kill us and that's not good and then there becomes apathy where I've done 500,000 tra traffic stops, nothing ever happens on these things and we walk up and then that's when something bad happens. So what we always want to do is we call officer safety, we're mindful of officer safety and it incorporates a whole bunch of different things from our training, from our physical fitness to our proficiency uh, in defensive tactics to our weapons proficiency but really just reading situations. And that's why uh, it's many times when people are uncooperative during situations that they don't have to be uncooperative. And that's where it starts to raise our, our level of suspicion. And that's where we start to have those conversations or those start to have that contact where I'm raising my voice and you're, you're frustrated or you're offended that I'm raising my voice, but really why I'm raising my voice is because I want to take control. We're not, I need to do something to take control of this situation. Uh, but you, hopefully you got a glimpse of, you can see how fast something that seems so mundane and so routine can, seem, can, can turn into uh, an officer involved shooting or, or definitely a, a critical situation. I don't want you just to keep it here. Take it with you, share it with others. This is not going to be the last time we do something like this. Uh, we want to do it more and more often. So share it with other people and let them know, especially those that are like in churches, community organizations. They need to be here. They need to see this. They need to experience it.